welcome back everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Irina Reich uh, for the next session. Um, so Irina is an associate professor in the computer science and operation research department at the Université de Montréal. And she's also a core member at MILA, the Quebec AI Institute. She holds the Canada SciFart AI Chair and the Canadian Excellence Research Chair in Autonomous AI. Um, her current research features many different topics, including continual lifelong learning, optimization, uh, lots of different specific topics, and in particular, in reinforcement learning, biologically plausible mechanisms, which brings us to the topic of her talk today. Uh, she very nicely agreed to talk about reward processing biases in humans and reinforcement learning agents. Before I, I leave the floor to Irina, I would like to remind everybody um, that we use the Q&A for questions. So far, it's worked really well. So thanks a lot, everybody, for participating that way. And in case you have long-term questions, you can always ask them on the matrix chat. Uh, but please prefer the Zoom Q&A for that. Irina, it's our great pleasure to have you here. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for a kind invitation and for introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm going to talk today uh, about, about some reward processing biases, as you mentioned, uh, both in human and uh, artificial agents. Let me share the screen. Okay, okay. Okay, can you see my screen well? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, now let me, um, supposed to be in the presentation mode. Okay, do you see it well now? Okay. Even better, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yes, indeed. Um, so this is um, relatively recent work with my colleagues uh, from IBM Research, where I actually I uh, used to be for quite a while before joining the University of Montreal. And um, oops, that was not intended. And also uh, with collaborators from Columbia University. So this work was um, uh, kind of done when I was there and continued until now. So it's very interesting research direction. And I'm really grateful to have great colleagues such as Malpai Han Lin as a graduate student at uh, Columbia University uh, who kind of did amazing work with this. And my uh, colleagues, Germo and Jalel from IBM and Jen Reinen, who is a neuroscientist as well there. So, um, Let's take a look at the classical picture of reinforcement learning problem uh, of artificial or uh, human agent. Uh, the classical picture assumes that there is agent uh, acting in the world. Um, okay, so for some reasons, I have the slide change that I didn't intend. Uh, so the agent take an action in the environment, receives reward, and the environment switches to another state, as we all know, and then the agent receives the new state of the environment if it's fully observable. Um, I really apologize for the slide switching. I don't know what, why it's... Okay, so I think I should have uh, changed the timing of those. So, sorry about that. Um, anyway, so uh, this is a classical picture and uh, it assumes that reward comes just in one stream. However, it's not the case in uh, reality and, and the situation is more complicated in how we actually process reward in our brains. Um, and again, I apologize for the timing thing. I think it's uh, what is said improperly. So in neuroscience and psychiatry, the reward processing was studied for a while and we know that dopamine plays an important role in that. Um, so basically it codes for the prediction error and uh, also the positive and negative reward are processed somewhat differently. And 
abnormalities in this process they can give rise okay, can give rise to different mental disorders. Okay, so I probably should have just really removed the timing on my slides. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. Yeah, I should have. Uh, yeah, so maybe I should just present it as is like on this screen. Um, okay, sorry about that. Okay. Let me just. Um, okay. I think it might be less interruptions and distractions if I just do it this way. Uh, you can still see it well, right? So, what I was trying to say that uh, there are different nuances about how reward is processed, and that positive and negative reward are also processed. Um, in different streams um, that I'm going to talk a little bit later, but the abnormalities, like extreme cases of that, can lead to various disorders uh, from Parkinson to ADHD, dementia, chronic pain that are associated with abnormal processing of reward. However, in general, you can think from like evolutionary psychiatry uh, point of view that different reward processing biases and different like inclinations towards, for example, uh, favoring and paying more attention to positive reward versus negative, or having a stronger memory and putting stronger weight on uh, positive or negative reward in the past, they are uh, not just fluctuations in the, how our brains work, but they are actually uh, somewhat caused by different environments in which particular kind of um, human agents were developing. So evolutionary psychiatry indeed tries to study how those different reward processing biases or in general, uh, different kind of traits, uh, psychological traits uh, emerge depending on which environment uh, the agent was exposed to. You can think that in extreme cases, uh, those traits become disorders, but if the case is not extreme, uh, having uh, somewhat different weights on positive, negative rewards, some, somewhat different approaches or avoidance behaviors may be appropriate depending on the situation. For example, if the environment really often presents you with lots of dangerous negative reward, then um, things like anxiety might be quite uh, evolutionary kind of uh, validated and useful. But if you switch to a different environment where um, kind of danger is less present and there are more positive rewards and you need to pursue them, then perhaps it's time to switch your uh, reward processing biases and preferences. I also could think potentially that having teams of agents like in multi-agent setting that have different traits could be useful because they can kind of collaborate and uh, depending on the environment, they can choose the best course of actions. So in any case, I'm just kind of trying to uh, give you some perspective on the fact that the reward processing is not that simple in uh, our brains as it's uh, usually presented in the classical reinforcement learning picture. And perhaps by using at least some of the inspirations from neuroscience and observations from psychiatry, we could make our agents somewhat more flexible. And uh, perhaps this flexibility can pay off when environments are non-stationary. Okay, so let me continue. So as I mentioned, learning from positive and negative rewards is indeed processed somewhat differently in our brains. And there are there is lots of studies about that. And one of them, which kind of motivated this line of work a few years ago, was this famous paper by Michael Frank and his colleagues from back of like 2004, uh, called by carrot or by stick, or cognitive reinforcement learning in uh, Parkinsonism. So basically, uh, as we all know, uh, the neurotransmitter dopamine plays a key role in reinforcement learning 
and uh, uh, any kind of uh, abnormalities in uh, dopamine production and processing can lead to different uh, changes in the behavior. And in Parkinson's disease in particular, we know uh, that the patients are usually, unless they have medications, they have depleted dopamine in the basal ganglia. So they can low on dopamine. And it is associated with both decision-making, uh, action, and uh, even uh, movement. So we all know the um, uh, classical symptoms in uh, Parkinsonian disease. So the uh, kind of effect on movements and inability to properly kind of move your hands and so on. So this is kind of the whole collection of symptoms that all related to kind of abnormalities of his dopamine production. And in this study, um, Michael Frank and his colleagues actually were giving different tasks to patients uh, with uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, off medication and on medication. So off medication, they had this low levels of dopamine on medication, it was increased. And they noticed the following thing that off medication patients are much better at learning to avoid negative rewards, to avoid choices that lead to something bad happening to them, rather than learning from positive outcomes. So they seem to be really putting more weight on negative reward and kind of ignoring positive, roughly speaking. However, uh, when given medications uh, increasing dopamine levels, uh, those patients uh, exhibited opposite behavior. And uh, their learning was uh, vice versa driven by positive outcomes rather than by negative ones. Uh, and it's been even uh, kind of it's known in the literature that um, in early days of uh, kind of trying to treat Parkinsonian patients with different uh, dopamine increasing drugs, uh, in extreme cases, some patients would go all the way and become gamblers and exhibit like addictive behavior and so on. So basically it was like a striking difference between off meds and on meds behavior. Also, of course, depends on meds. And uh, Michael Frank and his colleagues uh, developed this uh, model of go, no go behavior. Like I'm not gonna go into all details of this uh, uh, model trying to explain how exactly the dopamine affects decision-making, but the important part was separating uh, the reward processing in these two pathways, go and no-go pathways. And those essentially were showing us that positive and negative rewards are also processed separately. In more details, again, just like from that paper by uh, Michael Frank, like essentially you have, essentially you have the direct go and indirect no-go pathways of the basal ganglia. And the essence of the model is that those go cells, they essentially uh, promote action. So they disinhibit thalamus through this uh, internal segment of uh, lobus pallidus. Essentially what they do is they facilitate action, they facilitate execution of an action while no-go cells, why worse, vice versa, they have opposite effect on action. So they inhibit it uh, by increasing inhibition of thalamus. So basically, uh, yeah, you see the two pathways and they are specifically focused on uh, kind of relationship and uh, reaction to positive and negative reward to action and no action. Again, there are various other models and it's an uh, interesting uh, kind of direction to explore. But in this work, uh, we also kind of just uh, looked at some literature on um, abnormalities in reward processing biases in mental disorders. And uh, there are multiple, um, multiple accounts in literature uh, suggesting empirically uh, from brain imaging studies and from um, kind of, uh, behavioral evolution that, for example, patients with Alzheimer's disease not only exhibit um, issues with memory, as we all know, and uh, executive function issues, but also um, they do not pursue uh, reward as much. They seem to kind of ignore it. They lose appetite. So it's somewhat like diminished reward system activity. 
Uh, there are other type of disorders which also seem to have disruptions to the reward processing system, like this chromatotemporal dementia. Uh, here it's actually vice versa, potentially compulsive behaviors or overeating, uh, like paying too much attention to immediate reward. In attention deficit disorder, there is also often uh, reward processing abnormalities implicated by experiments. Uh, for example, the memory of previous rewards. Addiction is clearly associated uh, with uh, reward processing abnormalities where the negative reward is downplayed, positive immediate reward, such as um, like drug seeking is uh, really having much higher weight and the uh, memory as well of previously kind of negative rewards uh, obtained for particular behavior are also downplayed, so on and so forth. And clearly depression and chronic pain uh, with a classical symptom of anhedonia and decreased reward response are also well known. So people are not seeking reward and not taking actions as actively as they would have um, normally. Uh, the list goes on. I uh, just here to show that this uh, combinations of reaction to positive negative reward and the memories of positive ne uh, negative reward in the past uh, and basically different weights that uh, essentially the agent puts on them taken to extremes may essentially be associated with, uh, uh, with uh, neurological and psychiatric disorders but not taken to extreme they might be useful perhaps depending on the situation. Again, back to our reinforcement learning classical problem. Um, so that's what we know uh, we kind of use in the usual classical RL uh, setting. And here we will focus on these reward parameters that I mentioned uh, can be introduced. And again, there are multiple ways to probably expand the reinforcement learning model. Uh, what we propose is relatively simple, but it's kind of the first step and you need to start somewhere. But you will introduce the reward processing parameters in the um, algorithms that agent uses to perform reinforcement learning. And depending on settings, uh, there could be different algorithms such as Bandit, Contextual Bandit, and full-blown reinforcement learning that I will mention soon. Okay, so in reinforcement learning setting with reward processing focus, your goal is to come up with policy, agents policy as we all know, that will map the absorbed states of the environment to actions, and it hopefully will try to maximize the uh, total discounted reward, uh, like a classical goal. And here environment and reward parameters will be given uh, to uh, the algorithm. The goal will be for the agent to come up with a policy. There is also another interesting setting where this type of um, approaches can be useful. It's more like a behavioral modeling. So uh, while in machine learning and reinforcement learning, your goal is to use perhaps inspirations from the brain to come up with uh, better, more kind of uh, more accurate, more uh, performing uh, algorithms. In behavioral modeling, it's not the goal. The goal is rather to understand what are models, and say in this case, particular reward parameters, best describing behavior of actual agents like people. So kind of trying to match the observed behavior in certain tasks and uh, figure out what parameters um, of the algorithm would match that trajectory best and try to interpret it as uh, um, kind of certain reward processing biases or traits. Anyway, I just kind of wanted to give these two settings or two objectives because this research at the intersection of uh, like neuroscientific inspirations and machine learning can have two different type of goals, um, whether focused on machine learning performance or whether focused on better understanding of human behavior. Okay, so we will consider like the three levels of reinforcement learning in the increasing uh, uh, kind of uh, complexity level. 
uh, in a sense that the simplest model perhaps of reinforcement learning is so-called multi-armed bandit setting, which you probably all know about, um, or we're gonna hear about in the kind of this um, uh, lectures. You basically have an agent which takes an action and observes a reward, and that's it. And the name multi-armed bandit comes from the, um, kind of, for example, games in Las Vegas where you have those automata called bandits where you can essentially pull the arm and see what kind of reward you get. And essentially you're just learning to uh, choose the best actions to maximize your reward. That's all. But a bit more complicated and interesting setting is so-called contextual bandits where you are allowed to observe the state of the environment and your rewards are also dependent not just on your actions, but on that state. So state is called context and the bandits called contextual. But as you can see, your actions only produce reward. They do not change the context or the state. And finally, if you switch to the most complex scenario where the action can affect the state of the environment, we are in the full-blown reinforcement learning um, problem setting. So not only yeah, the action produces reward, which is also determined in which state the agent is, but the action can also affect and change that state. However, as I mentioned, we will focus here on the two stream uh, reinforcement learning models, which separate positive and negative rewards and process them separately. How specifically they will be processed depends on particular problem setting, whether it's bandit, contextual bandit, or reinforcement learning in general, and which particular algorithm you use. But as I mentioned, you will um, focus on positive rewards and process them in one stream and negative rewards will be processed in a separate stream. Your action will uh, produce both types of reward and uh, you will use the state from both streams to come up with that action. Okay, so here is the simplest example and uh, that's kind of uh, older work that we did back in 2017. Um, just to try this type of approach with two stream reward processing in the simplest multi arm bandit setting, not even contextual. And uh, this is a one of the classical alg algorithms for multi arm bandit problem um, based on Bayesian inference called Thompson something. Uh, perhaps you know about that or have seen it in other lectures, but essentially um, you keep the count of uh, wins and loses or positive negative rewards here. And uh, you decide on the action that will maximize your parameter theta, essentially drawn from a distribution, which is being updated based on this counts of positive and uh, negative rewards. So here, what we introduce to make it a bit richer and able to uh, react differently to positive negative rewards, as well as uh, the memory of those, we simply introduce four parameters. Uh, we introduce weights on the immediate positive negative reward. Here it's like uh, uh, SA and FA, um, wins and loses. And you also introduce weights W plus and W minus on your accumulated, um, oh, actually vice versa. So W plus and W minus are on the current reward positive or negative, and um, lambda plus and lambda minus are on the memory, on the accumulated reward um, over a sequence of time points. And that's essentially it. So with those four parameters, you can play. And uh, well, disclaimer, of course, this is just the um, particular instantiation of those parameters, which doesn't by any means explain completely certain disorders and the names we were given are indeed quote unquote, but we just try to reflect some of the traits associated with certain psychiatric disorders in the literature with changes in those parameters. So uh, 
basically, for example, the reduced lambda minus in addiction, so reduced memory of the past reward somewhat. Again, it's, it's quite arbitrary, and this uh, kind of settings of parameters were just for us to try uh, flexibility of the proposed approach. And uh, as I said, the names, it's definitely disclaimer. We are not saying that the patients with particular disorders are best described with those parameters. In order to actually come up with uh, such parameters, one would need to do a real study on the data sets collected for patients with particular disorders, performing different tasks, trying to feed those data to this uh, model and try to infer such parameters. But the point here was just to see that if you allow yourself a bit more flexibility on top of classical Thompson sampling, and you try it on various data sets, um, this is basically some data sets we tried back in 2017 in the paper that I mentioned. And you also put yourself in different settings of uh, mainly positive rewards, mainly negative rewards, or just the general setting on the next page. What you see here is that uh, the mental agents, quote unquote, how we call them, are practically always like outperforming the baseline Thompson sampling, which is a last column here. Basically, you do not see the baseline, the Thompson sampling being the best approach. You always see that one of the agents is better in this case. And the normal reward environment kind of it's the same. And in terms of average results, again, yes. So basically, uh, that's what we observe for just simple case of the uh, multi arm bended with specific algorithm, Thompson sampling expanded to incorporate those biases or weights on the immediate rewards and past rewards. You can also do a similar modification to, for example, contextual bending. And I will not go into all the details of the algorithm, but it's also essentially based on updating uh, certain probability distributions for the parameters based on observations. And whenever in like lines nine and 10, you update those parameters, uh, normally you're supposed to uh, kind of just update them based on the reward you get. Well, here we will split that reward into R plus and R minus, the positive and negative. And we will put again particular weights on the immediate reward that we are obtaining versus the history of that reward. So the same approach as we've seen before with Thompson sampling can be applied here. And finally, if we move on to the most generic setting of um, reinforcement learning, and uh, in this work, for example, we, con uh, we considered uh, one of the popular approaches uh, such as Q-learning. You maintain this Q function that depends on the state and action, and you update it constantly depending on the action you take. And essentially, again, you just have one such function and uh, you have some learning rate par uh, parameter and discount factor, and you update it every time you see the reward taken, uh, obtained by taking action A in a given state. And uh, you try to uh, basically estimate the optimal future value. And this is a, just a classical update uh, formula for Q-learning. However, what you can do here again, if you want to split the reward processing into two streams and you want to process each positive and negative stream of rewards separately and then recombine it, what you can do, again, there are multiple ways to do that. We tried a few versions and few approaches and then empirical results, I will mention kind of two of them. But essentially you can say that your Q function will be sum of two Q functions that are correspondingly uh, describing positive and negative uh, reward streams separately. And uh, you will be choosing action that maximizes it, you, uh, this Q function again, but when you observe your reward, you process it separately. 
you have this Q plus function that uses again two parameters. The W parameters are modulating how much you really value positive immediate reward, while lambda plus modulates how much you value the accumulated history of positive rewards. And similarly for negative rewards, you see the same pattern. So when you update your Q minus function separately, you also modulate basically the importance of negative reward by W minus and the importance of the memory of negative rewards by just lambda minus. So this, uh, for the details on this uh, split Q learning approach, you can uh, look at our last year paper at AMS, and it was also kind of earlier version of that uh, in HKI. But basically, that that paper uh, describes the details of the approach. So in terms of experiments, uh, what we tried here, we tried several uh, simulated environments and uh, uh, actual kind of realistic games that I will describe soon. Um, and the point was just to see how different variations in the structure of the reward um, will affect uh, our agents and how the um, uh, kind of this more flexible parametric approach will compare with just the basic Q learning, as well as uh, with um, like algorithms like SARS and other baselines. So here, essentially, uh, the simulated environment says that you'll start in some state A, and you can make a decision to go left or right to state B or C. But once you get to, say, state B, then uh, essentially you will sample uh, reward from a particular distribution, this RD, which in the picture is uh, the blue uh, bimodal distribution. So they're kind of the reward distributions are non-Gaussian here. They're bimodal. And if you go to the right, it will be a different reward distribution. So in this particular setting, you can see that going to the right will correspond to a better action eventually because your reward distribution, the orange one, is shifted toward higher reward values. Okay, so and what we observe here so essentially, there are multiple baselines compared uh, with our SQL or split QL algorithm. And as I mentioned, there were two versions of that. I only presented one. Uh, we compared with also PQL, MQL are just like positive or just negative versions, which only pay attention to one type of reward. And they usually do not work that well. Uh, but just to try what will happen with the extreme. Basic Q learning, just standard Q learning is um, black curve here. And um, there was also the DQL algorithm shown in blue here, uh, used as a baseline. Also SARSA, yellow. And essentially what you can see that both in terms of uh, percentage of choosing the better action going left or right, uh, the plot on the left, and in terms of cumulative uh, rewards, uh, the green and red curves corresponding to two kind of variations, but essentially kind of the same idea, like four weights of the split QL algorithm, they always come on top um, consistently kind of in both types of um, evaluation measures. And then uh, we also were kind of curious to see, um, just to explore like behavioral modeling and uh, this is still kind of ongoing work, but there is this um, classical uh, task in uh, psychology literature, so-called Iowa gambling task for behavioral modeling and uh, for figuring out different uh, kind of reward processing traits uh, for people and also trying to see how different disorders affect those. Essentially, you have four decks of cards and uh, Roughly speaking, the decks A and B are bad, while decks C and D are good. In what sense? The bad decks have a higher reward per card, and, but basically you have infrequent, but really huge losses, for example, in deck B. 
Uh, so overall, although you have kind of higher positive reward, rewards, you also can have really high negative rewards. And overall, it's not a good um, kind of not a good strategy to choose those because your overall expected value is negative. While the other two decks uh, do not have as high of a reward per card, but negative rewards are smaller and they also maybe not as frequent. So there are different flavors, uh, different schemes of this Iowa gambling task. It's, a, as I said, very classical type of a task that people use in psychological literature to study um, reward processing behavior. And um, there is even this famous paper, uh, famous old paper by Antonio Damasio and his collaborators, uh, essentially studying decision making and at what level it happens. I mean, uh, it's a little bit off topic, but I really, really like that result. It's quite kind of amazing. Essentially, uh, uh, they were doing psychophysics and measuring uh, skin conductance, which reflects essentially the level of stress. Uh, when you stressed your skin, basically you start sweating and your skin is a little bit uh, kind of wet. So they were using this type of measurements while um, subjects were doing the, uh, the task. And the interesting thing they found was that it took, I think, more than 50 or so draws to figure out for a subject which decks are advantages versus which are bad. It took, I don't remember exactly, but I think even much more like around 80 draws to explain why that strategy is correct. But it took only 10 or so draws before the person even realized consciously what is going on but the signal was already picked up by the skin conductance measures. The person was becoming a bit stressed when uh, their hand was approaching the bad deck. So that was quite amazing thing that the decision-making may be happening at some much lower level than we used to think and way, way earlier. So it's almost like a gut feeling which happens before the person even realizes consciously which strategy is correct and definitely before the person can explain. But anyway, so that was a bit of a um, off topic, just a exciting result uh, related to this type of uh, data set. So in any case, we, we basically use this data and we try to see, yeah, this is highly non-Gaussian reward distribution, like what happens. And uh, we basically just were exploring how different agents, what trajectories they will take. And we do see some drastic differences depending on which parameters we use, um, and they kind of associated with these different quote-unquote disorders, that trajectories of different mental agents indeed differ quite drastically. So this would be a good tool for uh, studying in the future the reward processing traits of uh, humans. Okay, finally, uh, going back to the reinforcement learning, we also explored how those uh, kind of expanded approaches will behave on uh, games, for example, Pac-Man. And as you probably know, the game is about this uh, Pac-Man character moving in the maze and uh, getting, basically trying to avoid to be killed by ghosts, in which case, uh, Basically, the game stops and he gets a reward of minus 500 and you can restart it for the next episode and so on and so forth. Uh, the goal is also try to, as soon as possible, get through the maze. So for each step, you get penalty of minus one. And uh, you need to eat those pack dots and you get rewards like, for example, plus 10 for eating each of them. And uh, if you eat all of them, yeah, you win, you get plus 500. Uh, there are some additional details to this game. There are some special power pellets and so on. Uh, if you eat them, you can actually temporarily become stronger than ghosts and so on and so forth. So the bottom line here was that we also tried to simulate a much more challenging non-stationary settings. Uh, essentially, uh, 
we're trying to see how the different agents would perform in so-called lifelong or continual learning setting, which I, if I have time, I'll briefly mention at the end, um, kind of at least some um, kind of general ideas of that, not just uh, like in the reinforcement learning, it's popular field in just a classical supervised uh, uh, machine learning. But this is more challenging behavior because your environment is non-stationary and we introduce different kinds of uh, non-stationarity here. For example, uh, you can temporarily mute your reward. So you basically turn off positive rewards or you turn off negative rewards, or you can do something even more confusing for the agent. Uh, you could, uh, for example, flip the rewards. So actually the, all the positive rewards become negative and vice versa. So that's probably the most kind of challenging and confusing type of non-stationarity. And uh, reward scaling when positive or negative rewards becoming uh, scaled up or scaled down. So with all these different um, experiments and different non-stationarities, um, what we observed, I'm oh, sorry for typo. Okay, we observed that in stationary setting, first of all, just in a regular setting, uh, the split QL was very consistently and noticeably outperforming the baselines. So basically this yellow line was outperforming the DQL, the blue one, and the, just the basic Q learning, the gray one. A uh, similar thing was happening with this reward muting when we were turning off and on positive negative rewards time to time. Um, the same trend continued later on as well, when um, essentially we were rescaling the reward. The reward flipping was indeed the most challenging setting because it was really confusing. And in this case, what's interesting to note that some of some versions of this so-called well, mental agents were actually outperforming the just basic split to learning uh, with like equal weights and all the other baselines. And uh, not making any far-reaching claims, but it was interesting to see uh, that the agent with parameters that were supposed to quote unquote simulate ADHD uh, traits uh, was switching fast, only paying attention to their current rewards um, and not really keeping that much of a memory from the past was adapting indeed quite quickly to this very confusing, very fast paced changing conditions. Again, as I said, the big disclaimer is that by no means we're claiming to have captured the whole reward processing kind of model in particular psychiatric disorders. It's purely inspiration and ideas that would suggest maybe how to modify the weight parameters. So that's why all the names of the disorders should be taken with a grain of salt here. <laughs> okay, and then actually, if you look at those mental agents in action, uh, that's essentially was um, uh, games for each type of the agent there. Um, for example, CP stands for chronic pain here, ADD for addiction. And it, it, sometimes you would see some um, behaviors that kind of would be quite intuitive. For example, the agent is chronic pain, quote unquote, was very reluctant to move uh, and pursue any reward and only would move to avoid uh, like imminent threat of being eaten by ghosts while the, addic uh, the agent, uh, the ADD agent was indeed pursuing reward without paying even too much attention uh, whether the ghost is nearby and whether it's like a dangerous uh, course of action to take. Again, as I said, the point here is not to provide the uh, precise and correct model of psychiatric disorders. The point here is to show that if you expand your approaches, your algorithms, in different reinforcement learning settings with a more flexible uh, model for processing positive negative reward, not only separately, but with different weights, you have 
basically a larger pool of agents and depending on circumstance, some perform better than others. Uh, so it just provides you with somewhat more flexible and powerful type of approaches. And uh, just to mention uh, where it all can go and what potentially future directions could be here. It's a um, type of a research that um, not just we, but uh, there are many other groups are uh, very interested in at the intersection of AI and neuroscience or neuropsychiatry, where you want to go both ways. You would like to use some inspirations from neuroscience, psychology, and psychiatry to hopefully come up with more sophisticated and better performing AI methods. At the same time, you interested in using models um, and algorithms from reinforcement learning for behavioral modeling of human agents for better understanding um, basically how they make decisions. And these parametric models, if they are actually, um, if you attempt to feed them to real human decision-making data, uh, and you see how parameters they make, give you some ideas on how to explain certain reward processing traits there. And of course, it can be, uh, I can think about various applications of this type of approaches, and not only just trying to do some maybe clinical discoveries and better understanding disorders, getting better AI systems, you can also think about monitoring mental health with games and so on and so forth. Basically, if you see that behavioral trajectory of the person start being more similar to those of a depressed person, it may raise some red flag and you may would like, you may want to kind of interfere and so on and so forth. So maybe the behavior of the person as uh, shown uh, by their actions in, for example, a game can tell you a lot about their mental state and uh, perhaps about changes in those mental states and uh, whether the trajectory is going somewhere where you wouldn't want it to go. Okay, so that's kind of, there are many other potential, of course, uh, uses and applications of this type of modeling. But as I mentioned earlier, I just wanted to say very briefly that most realistic setting in which you would like to test um, decision-making models as well as do behavioral modeling are the setting uh, related to so-called continual lifelong learning. And that's why we introduced uh, non-stationarities in the Pac-Man game. And uh, I don't have much time to talk about that. So I'll just show a few slides. Uh, this is a rapidly growing field in all sub areas of machine learning, not just in reinforcement learning, but classical uh, supervised and unsupervised learning. And essentially you assume that there is a data stream, in this case, in the supervised learning notation, and time to time, the data sets change or the properties of the data distribution change. And you may or may not be told so. Uh, the simplest setting you are told that the data distribution changed or the task changed. Locally, the data are IAD, just like in classical machine learning, but in general, you keep moving from IAD to OD to out of distribution data sets. And uh, this field is even more challenging than very popular and active field of out of distribution generalization because it kind of involves the issues of auto-distribution generalization. You would like to learn on given data and be able to generalize to other data sets, which may be drastically different, although share in common some kind of um, uh, invariant mechanisms, usual assumption in auto-distribution generalization. But there is another problem here, not typically uh, the problem considered in OD generalization, the problem of catastrophic forgetting, because at the same time, you want to still be able to perform well the tasks you learned before. And uh, there is a whole field of continual learning and approaches that trying to mitigate catastrophic forgetting while at the same time uh, adapting fast and generalizing well to the novel data. And this field uh, is also related to many other 
well-known and popular subfields of machine learning, including obviously multitask learning, but continual learning is sequential and you don't see all the tasks at the same time. It relates to transfer learning and domain adaptation for obvious reasons and to meta learning, but all those fields do not have the challenging sequential or temporal aspect of continual learning. While online learning has this aspect, but usually only assumes IED data, and therefore continual learning is in a sense, the most challenging setup that combines not only online learning, but online learning across uh, non-stationary data streams. With the final goal, as I mentioned, to both maximize transfer to the future, transfer of your knowledge, <clears throat> basically generalization, and minimize interference, which is forgetting. <clears throat> so this is kind of <clears throat> ultimate goal of uh, continual learning in various settings, and particularly the most exciting and rapidly growing area is the continual reinforcement learning. Uh, which I will not go into detail right now, but if you're interested, you can take a look at our uh, recent survey on um, recent, recently proposed continual reinforcement learning approaches and uh, benchmarks. And uh, this field is indeed grows rapidly. And perhaps since the uh, moment we uh, put that survey on archive, uh, there are many more novel approaches that are not described there, but I think this is uh, this is the most natural setting for continual uh, reinforcement learning is the most natural setting for studying continual lifelong learning, and definitely uh, closest to uh, real life challenges of agents uh, moving through environments and not only doing pattern recognition but taking action. So I guess uh, I will stop here and I uh, will take questions. Thank you very much, Irina. Uh, it was an incredible talk, uh, really interesting. And um, lots of questions have been popping up. Um, most of them, the TAs or myself were absolutely unable to answer <laughs> on the fly. So there are 13 questions left uh, on the stack. I don't know if we will have time to go through all of them, but I'll try to, to pass them on to you. And, and first of all, really, thank you very much. Um, I, I'll start with um, a few questions on the algorithm itself, on the split reward to learning. Um, a few attendees have been asking, uh, what is the link like, could we relate split reward queue learning with multi-objective reinforcement learning or with reinforcement learning with various learning rates, like separate learning rates, um, in a maybe in a mechanical way or in an algorithmic way? Uh, what are the connections there? Yeah, that, that's indeed a, <clears throat> indeed a good point about the multi multi multi-objective multi-criteria uh, reinforcement learning, where indeed you will have uh, kind of different sources of reward and you would like to combine it. Uh, the approaches, okay, so I think the, uh, the difference could be in how you handle um, those uh, different uh, parts of the reward, how exactly you solve this multi-criteria problem. Uh, so this, as I said, I mean, this was just a specific approach of really keeping the streams of positive negative rewards separate and introducing these different ways on those. <clears throat> Perhaps um, well, one could just uh, for each part of the um, a compound reward, what one could potentially keep a separate stream. Um, it might not be, well, I mean, you potentially can, I guess, combine it into the uh, common reward with some weighting scheme as well. So that might be, might be one approach to try indeed, if that was a question. So yeah, so you kind of, if you can ex extend the number of streams beyond two, you know, that was a question. <clears throat> but um, specific, specific way of implementing that, that's I guess where the difference is making, <laughs> maybe uh, kind of more obvious. But yeah, I, I mean, there is definitely this relationship with uh, 
yeah, with uh, it also depends on the relationship between those different criteria. Here. Yeah, because here it's kind of in a sense uh, positive is opposite of negative when you combine them into one reward. While in general multi criteria, there might be no not necessarily such a clear, clear relationship between different parts of the reward. But it's it's definitely I think a possible approach to that setting as well. Sure. Th thanks very much. There are a lot of questions of people asking you uh, if you could uh, provide the slides or give all the list of references, the data, the experiments. So maybe offline after the talk, we can maybe discuss that if, if you're okay with that. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. So um, yeah, I will definitely provide the links. So, so sorry, but I should have, yeah, I'll definitely share slides and uh, yeah. Um, I can share right now in the chat. Uh, so there is, there were essentially three papers. Uh, they kind of overlap somewhat. There was this kind of overview, empirical study of human behavioral agents that I just posted. And uh, there was on archives, this story of two streams. I mean, this was an earlier paper uh, that we kind of build upon. And the, the most recent, the AMS paper that I mentioned was uh, here. Okay. But yes, I will definitely share the slides with the links. Great. And this is, okay. Uh, that would be probably better to give you archive version of that, but for the sake of time, yeah, sure. we maybe will take that offline. We probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, there was one question asking, do you know of any work that studies the imposter syndrome as a biased credit assignment where the agent attributes the opposite positive rewards to stochasticity instead of their action, but attributes negative rewards entirely to their own actions? So this maybe moves a little away from the field of reinforcement learning per se, but uh, um, it's might it might be an, an opening. Yeah, I mean it's it's, it's very interesting questions, more closer to I guess uh, the psychology neuroscience literature. But the short answer is no. At this point, I'm not aware of such work. But again, absolutely doesn't mean that it doesn't exist because there is so much out there. But I think it, it's it's actually a very interesting problem to model. Uh, so actually, I would be curious myself to find out if there is something out there about that. Um, Shay, I'm just kind of browsing through the questions now, trying to sort out really, um, uh, there is one question I'm asking because I'm not sure I understood it, to be honest. <laughs> Could introducing the stochastic flipping be a way to test the robustness of a reinforcement learning algorithm? Could we add a deep learning model that could be trained to correct the stochastic flipped reward? Uh, it asked the deep learning model for stochastic reward per testing. Well, I guess, of course, you can put, you can include the deep learning model or well, you can include any, any function approximation model. And of course you can have a good quality deep learning model there. Uh, but I think the question kind of had two parts. So basically whether flipping reward can be kind of a really hard test of the stability of robustness of reinforcement learning algorithms. Yeah, I, I think yes, but uh, it also depends. I mean, if it's, uh, if it's too much flipping, yeah, you need to be reasonable because uh, no reasonable agent will be able to kind of adapt to completely nonsensical flipping of positive and negative reward, which happens all the time because then, um, yeah, so you, you might not be able even to ask any agent to be that robust. Yeah, but I think some reasonably, kind of reasonably non-stationary flipping. Anyway, so I, it, it felt like it, it, it's really kind of pushing the agent um, to start adapting only to what what's happening now to their kind of current episode and completely ignore what they learned before because you flipped pretty much the reward system completely. 
yeah so i guess i guess it depends i mean uh, it is probably a really tough good test but you also need to be reasonable and not to ask your agent to uh, act in completely chaotic environment sure and that that would actually also relate to the framework of continual reinforcement uh, continual yeah learning. yeah so this is i mean the whole point of those changing uh, the non-stationary environments in the pacman was to try different flavors of continual learning but again if you want somewhat realistic setting i mean you are not supposed to add too much non-stationarity because then then it's impossible to learn anything but yeah i will abuse my position as chairman to ask you my personal question at the end okay <laughs> I was wondering whether you have uh, investigated the possibility to work in inverse reinforcement learning for, um, for in that framework where you actually split the reward in two or even more parts if needed. You, you kind of you kind of uh, mentioned it at the end, and I was wondering for a while, like like could this be reversed? Could this actually um, yeah. serve for diagnosis purposes? Or, or identification of systems, or even debugging of uh, artificial reinforcement learning agents. I don't know. Have you have you looked into that? Yeah, we uh, we didn't yet, but yes, we we thought about that, and it's definitely quite relevant. Uh, and like I was also mentioning, like you could uh, just as you can use these parametric approaches for behavioral modeling and try to figure out from the actions of a patient well, or the subject, uh, what is going on in terms of reward processing biases and trying to infer those biases, essentially. Uh, you can do similar things, yeah. You, you, you could definitely apply it to inverse reinforcement learning and uh, yeah, potentially, again, I mean, it might not necessarily be the right model for any kind of behavior, but it, if it happens to capture some aspects, then at least you would be interested in figuring out those parameters. Yeah, so the, the brief answer is yes, it is closely relevant and it would be interesting to try, but no, we didn't yet try it explicitly, just kind of thought about that. Okay, I guess we're really running out of time now. So I will thank you a lot, uh, Irina, again. Thanks very much. Um,